So, today we're back in the Word, we're back in the book of Genesis, and we're going to look at the new beginning that happens with Noah's three sons. Uh, my three sons, <laughs> as, as he would say. We're going to pick it up in chapter 9, the second half. Now the sons of Noah, they went out of the ark, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. And so as we get into this and, and we look at what happens after the flood in this new beginning, there's a bit of a soap opera that's going to occur, and uh, I'll walk you through it, and hopefully you'll, you'll be up to, to speed. So we saw last week this new world where all of the animals were let out of their cages, everybody left the ark, God sends the rainbow and makes a promise. Um, I get ahead of myself. And so some of the things that I told you guys to look out for was much shorter lifespans because of the, the environment and what's changed on the earth, how God is going to reiterate a monogamous relationship, a, a heterosexual marriage, which is one man and one woman. And we see that there were eight saved in all. Each man had a wife, not multiple wives. And so we looked at all of these things last week. So I don't want to beat it to death. And they were the ones that were going to have to get busy and repopulate the entire earth. And it was as though it were the Garden of Eden, just with more participants. And everything got started. And uh, now we know why animals are afraid of us, because that's part of <laughs> what's, what's left on the earth. There was also the eating of meat that is now permissible. So I apologize to all of you who are vegetarians that... This is what the Word of God says. It's permissible to eat meat. Uh, so the, the carnivore has now entered the world. We... Oh, by the way, if you have a cell phone, don't forget to turn your cell phone off or it will cause you incredible, incredible amount of shame. I say this to your benefit. We... We looked at government being set up that if you were a murderer and you murdered someone, your life would be forfeit. And this is something that was set up here all the way back with Noah. So the death penalty was instituted by God a long time ago. And there weren't any police to carry this out and they didn't have prisons. You were to carry out this, your family members, your closest family member, male family member would execute justice on the person that took your life. If it's intentional manslaughter, you forfeit your life. It was unintentional. There's a whole process in the law that gets followed later. But if there is, if you become a murderer and you, you let yourself go to that degree, you forfeit your life. And that's a biblical principle. And it carries all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament. And we talked about that last week and how all of the animals were let loose and allowed to multiply. We looked at this covenant that God made and notice it's a one-sided covenant. And he says, even though man is evil from the days of his youth, never again will I flood the earth the way that I did. And he says, every time I look at the rainbow, I'll remember my covenant. And it's a one-sided covenant, by the way. It's, it's not dependent on how wicked and horrible and terrible we are because boy, the world's certainly gotten a, a whole lot worse, I think in the, in the past several years. But God will not destroy the earth. And we looked in 2 Peter 3, 7, which talks about fire coming next, how God makes this covenant and how Jesus makes a new covenant with us that the covenant he makes with us is come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest, which is what Noah's name means, which I think is wonderfully ironic how it pulls together. And so as God looks at the sign that he's left for us in the new covenant, I, I believe that's the cross. The cross that Jesus Christ hung on. Not that it's a magical emblem, but it's something much like when we take communion that reminds us of what Jesus did and the covenant that God made with us through the blood of his son, not the sacrifice of an animal. And so we looked at all of that last week. So this week, we're gonna get back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I call this the unwelcome stowaway. Can you figure out which one of them is the unwelcome stowaway on the ark? Hmm. It's a conspiracy theory. So what we're going to see is family dysfunction, shaming and ridicule, gossip and an unwillingness to cover another's sin, loyalty and disgrace, character assassination, blessing and cursing, and drunkenness. 
So we've got a full card today. It's like the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> Verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk. And he became uncovered in his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant, and may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So we're given few words about this period of time that encompasses hundreds of years, but we're given this situation where the sons of, uh, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth come, and they're now going to populate the whole earth. So everyone is related to one of these three. And in the next chapter, it talks about how they proliferated and where they moved and the naming of all those countries. So you don't have to go to genetics.com necessarily. Uh, they'll tell you which one you're related to, but uh, we'll, we'll actually get down to where they populated. It says that the sons of Noah went out into the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. Why bring up Canaan? It seems rather random. Here's three sons, and oh, by the way, Ham was the father of Canaan. Why mention Canaan in this discussion of family tree. He's, he's an offspring of Ham. Why is that singled out? It's strange. Well, they become some of the biggest enemies of Israel, obviously. The Jebusites, the Amorites, all of them come from, all the ites come from the line of Ham, and they become the arch enemies of Israel. But it just seems unusual you'd mention the three and only one of the grandchildren of, of Noah and who he was related to. Whenever I see things like stick out like that, I wonder, Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? Because it's on purpose. I believe that every single word of the word of God is intentional and it's scripted by God. And so if that's the case, it, it's a pleasure and a mystery to figure out what in the world that's about. Canaan. Canaan becomes the father of the Canaanites, obviously, who are the arch enemies of Israel. But there might be something else. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Well, this is his second occupation. I don't know how many uh, life occupations you've had, but he was a preacher of righteousness, and he built a boat for 120 years, so he was a master builder. And then he was in a boat with a bunch of animals for 377 days. So he was a sea captain, I guess, but he didn't do any of the steering. And he was running a zoo. And now he's going to be a farmer. That, that's what's nice about a lot of years. You get to pick those things. <laughs> and he drank of the wine and was drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. By the way, this is the first time wine, the word wine is used in the scripture, uh, which is rather interesting, and also the word drunk. So here's Noah. He's, one of the things he does, I'm sure he's planting other things because they have to live off the land in addition to animals. They're omnivores, not just carnivores. And so one of the things that he does that's mentioned is he makes a vineyard and he grows some awesome grapes. Probably has people come in from all around, driving in to Noah's Valley. <laughs> but Noah's doing this for himself and it says that he drank of the wine that he made and he became drunk. So, drinking wine is not necessarily a sin, but drunkenness certainly is. Drinking wine is not a sin, but drunkenness certainly is. And so here's Noah, 
who's gone off the deep end. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by them is not wise. So the scripture cautions anybody who's going to drink alcohol, you got to be careful because you might get into a fight. (laughs) You might get into an argument at least. Because what it does is it unhinges your heart and the things that you wouldn't naturally say suddenly come out of your mouth. Some of you do that naturally. (laughs) And some of you need a little help. So scripture is uh, warning us to be careful. It also says in Proverbs 23, it paints this really interesting picture. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? That's arguments and and fights, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, those who linger long over wine, those who go in and search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. You're seasick laying on your bed. Any of you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Scripture's true. Your heart will utter perverse things and it would be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of a mast. That's even worse. Because the mast does extreme what the, what the sea does slowly. They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? That's an experience, isn't it? Wow. Why am I bleeding? Is that my blood? What? Ow. Ow. What happened? Oh, you should have seen what you did last night. How many of you have had, no, no, I don't want to see your hands. (laughs) I wonder if any of you have had a report from someone that you spent the previous night with that told you everything that you did because you don't remember. I have a shameful past like that. I I remember waking up on my front lawn one day, covered in dew, because they had been there for hours. Yes. My uh, wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler. The one who was led astray by them is not wise. I was not wise. I can tell you since Christ, I haven't fallen asleep on my lawn. (laughs) Here's a statistic for you. One out of 14 people who try alcohol will become an alcoholic. That's one out of 14 that just taste it. So it is something that you have to be very, very, very careful with. It's not something that's prohibited. It's something in the scriptures that actually speaks of joy. If you remember, Jesus himself made gallons. If I remember, it's 744 bottles at 750 milliliters. That's what he chipped in to a wedding party once. And it was good alcohol. It wasn't grape juice. It was good alcohol, trusting that it would be used wisely, I imagine, much like he entrusts us to do the same. So alcohol isn't necessarily the problem. It's usually the intention of our hearts that are the real issue. So Ecclesiastes 10.1 says, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. We just went over this in, at men's breakfast on Saturday. We're in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the brave men going through the depression book uh, where life is meaningless. Everything under the sun is meaningless. Work, you know, uh, making a name for yourself, all these things are worthless uh, in in light of eternity. And as we've been looking at that, we ran across this passage this past week. You know, just, you can build a life of character and blow it with one bad decision. You can destroy your life and all of us are right on that tightrope of destroying our entire lives. All you have to do is have a couple to get inebriated and get behind the wheel and your whole life might change. 
The rest of your life might be spent in prison or paying fines or living with the guilt of having killed someone in a head-on collision. Or maybe your loved ones will have to live with the fact that you accidentally killed yourself having too much wine. So those are the things that we have to bear. So be careful because it happened to Noah. And Noah was a righteous man. In fact, God saw he was so righteous, he delivered him and his family. So Galatians 5.16, I think, has the solution to that. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Aren't you glad? I'm glad the spirit of God lives inside of me so that I wouldn't do what I feel like I want to do all the time. I, I'm glad that the spirit of God's in you and you don't do the things that you want to do all the time. Because I'm sure I would have heard it by now. <laughs> Walk in the spirit. In other words, going in, having a relationship with Jesus Christ through his shed blood on the cross, the forgiveness of my sins, the cleansing of my life. I have an open relationship with God and I'm always living in a conversational, living, breathing relationship with God. That's what it is to walk in the spirit. It's to submit your life completely and entirely, continuously on doing whatever he wants you to do. That's what it is to walk in the spirit. And when you do that, you don't get caught up in the other stuff that you would as if you weren't. We talked about that yesterday. Dino brought up how the word of God is such a transformative thing in our lives. As we read the word and as we pray and as we, as you guys are coming and sitting here, thank you very much for coming. It's to your benefit actually to be here. It's to my benefit to be here because I get to hear the word of God and I get to have fellowship with you guys and pray with you. And it keeps me out of a lot of trouble. Because if I have to be here on a Sunday preaching, then, you know, I wasn't out last night tying one on and doing crazy things. And it's one of those things when you're living in the Spirit of God, knowing what it is that God would have you do, you tend to find yourself in the most bizarre circumstances, and God seems to direct every little thing in your life. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, wow, I... You know, I just for some reason decided to go over here and it started a conversation and I was able to share Christ with them. And amazing, I never would have gone over there or done that had I not felt like the Spirit of God inclining me to do that. All those kind of things is what it is to walk in a relationship with God. And it's the most fulfilling way to live. When we live in the flesh and we do what our natural bodies tell us to do without question, without filter, without governance, we do stupid things. That's all of us, myself included. So, please consider with me just a possible motive. Why would Noah do this? I mean, sure, he grew a vineyard. It doesn't mean you need to get drunk. And he drank the wine, and that, that doesn't mean you need to get drunk. So what, what do you think is going through him? And I sometimes wonder what people's motivations are for things. He's a preacher of righteousness, and for 120 years, he's building a boat. He's got a floating zoo for 377 days. So he's doing all of these things. My question is, what's he doing now? A lot of nothing. One of the worst things of the pandemic is the people got paid to stay home and do nothing. You know how much suicide went up? You know how much overdose went up? You know, I talk about depression. So a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists making big money off this. Because when there's a loss of purpose, when there's a loss of calling, when there's a loss of mission in our lives, we do stupid things. It's staying on mission to know that God has called you to a particular thing. And doing that thing is what keeps us on the track. And we go, no, I... Temptation comes and you go, I can't do that. <laughs> Forget about it. I'm busy. I, I, I don't have time for that. I, I, I got to do this. And we keep following the leading of the Spirit of God instead of doing what we would otherwise. I think Noah got himself in a place where he lost his purpose, his usefulness. I don't know how many people I've known in the past 
to just languish in retirement. Retirement can be a great opportunity to do something good for the kingdom of God, for you to pass on wisdom and knowledge and information that you've accumulated over the years. Most people think it's a, I'm punching out. I think maybe that's what happened with Noah. So, like Noah, we are tempted most when we are not on mission. I don't know about you, but when I go on vacation, I used to think I went on vacation from God. I'm on vacation, man. I could do what I want, say what I want, jump on the bed all I want. I could do whatever I want. But if I realize that every day, that every moment, every person in my life has been put there by God for a purpose, and that I have a part in something he's doing, oh, that's a very different thing, isn't it? And you want to talk about real joy? You know, we think being happy is important, but happy comes and happy goes. Joy is one of those things where you know you've done something significant and good, and you know you yielded to the Spirit of God, and the Lord, I think, winks. He says, that a boy, I'm proud of you. I don't know about you, but I live for that. Amen. So like no, I think we're tempted most when we're not on mission. You just unplug and say, that's it, I'm done. I know jobs I've gotten and I've been working at that job and then you know, I get hurt or, or something uh, hurts my feelings or my boss says something unkind. I go, I ain't doing nothing. That is a bad place to be. You won't have that job long because they don't pay you for doing nothing. You try to squeeze out of things and do the bare minimum just to keep employed and you're opening yourself up for bigger things. Don't do it. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and he told his brothers outside. Okay. <laughs> so he... The way we react to other people's failures and weaknesses should be... Reveal to us much of our own hearts. I mean, it sounds like he just opened the tent, walked in. He's, oh, <laughs> that's my dad. He's naked. Awkward. Right? Come on, people. That's awkward. <laughs> Walk with me down this weird road. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's in the Bible. It's okay. Let's figure this out. When it says that he saw his father's nakedness, the word for saw in the original Hebrew means stared at, studied, and inspected thoroughly. <laughs> That's what the Hebrew word means. By the way, told. He went and published with arrogance and mockery. So this isn't just, oh, guess what I just saw. Whew. Don't go there, man. You know, he... That's not it. He lingered. He inspected long. It's weird. And then he published to his brothers this with mockery. I think of the words of Jesus in chapter 6 of Luke. He says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank in your own eye, hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. You see, Ham is the type of a person that seems to find fault, and then he likes to repeat this knowledge to everyone. We call it gossip. There's a billion dollar industry based on gossip. Did you hear about so-and-so? They went to a, a rehab and, you know, they were on drugs and they were doing crazy things and, you know, and their children. Oh, my goodness. Coach, tune in next week. We'll tell you about their children. There's like a whole industry based on gossip. Not, not about me, but about famous people. You hear about Brad and Angelina? <laughs> There's like a whole world of people getting their noses into other people's business inspecting very closely and finding out information that nobody should publish. Nobody should know private things like that. And yet the whole world knows. 
And so Ham went and stared at, studied, inspected thoroughly his father's nakedness. And then he went and told with mockery in his voice about what he had seen. Be sure you're clean before doing surgery on someone else's eye. Can you imagine getting eye surgery and a doctor says, yeah, you know, he's got a cigarette in his mouth. His hands are all dirty. And you go, hey, doc, uh, you going to use those hands on my eye? Yeah, don't, don't worry about it, kid. We got this. He's all unshaven. You can smell alcohol on his breath. And you go, hey, before you put that mask on me, get me another doctor. I don't care what sort of paper he's got hanging on the wall. He is not qualified to be here operating in my eye. That's what happens when we try to correct people when we ourselves have issues. We're supposed to take care of the stuff in our own life first, get our hands clean, get our face shaved, get washed up, cleaned up, don't smoke. Make sure you're sterile and you're standing there with all of your faculties ready to do your job. Ham was not in that place or else he wouldn't have mocked his father. When I find myself getting in a place of super judgment, like I'm God's spiritual police, I realize that there's probably something in my heart that's lingering that shouldn't be there because that's not my job. And certainly it wasn't Ham's job towards his dad for him to go and publish this. But Shem, Japheth, took a garment and they laid it on both their shoulders and they went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. They covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. There's a lot of nakedness in the scripture here. It's interesting when you have a situation like this, I think of the words of Shakespeare, which is, to cover or not to cover? That is the question. When do you cover someone's sin? And when do you expose someone's sin? Because there is a place for exposure, isn't there? There's also a place to cover. Knowing the difference is sometimes difficult. So when do you cover a sin? James 5, 19 and 20 says this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Notice it says cover a multitude of sins. There's a way in which we privately go to one another and say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And having prayed about this and maybe sought secret counsel, not using your name, get somebody else in on this to pray with me and help me and say, what do I do about this? And then you go to them and say, listen, I've come to understand this about you and you're doing this behavior or what's going on. It says, do you realize that you can be an instrument of God to save a soul from death? And yet many of us shrink from that because we're just cowardly and we don't want to upset anyone don't want anyone's feelings to get hurt and yet what happens if you don't do anything and you find out that they die because of the thing that you were supposed to talk to them about will you not bear that on your shoulders for the rest of your life I know people that have know that when you approach somebody there's a way that you do it with a right heart with the Spirit of God being involved, with somebody being anointed by God and the Spirit of God working on the other end as well. And when that happens, God brings salvation and repentance and reconciliation. When we do it in our flesh, it's like we want to pound somebody down because they've disappointed us. You know, like an angry father against a son. You stupid idiot, how could you have been so stupid? I can't believe you did this thing and I... Uh, no, you people have never, ever gone off on someone like that, but I have. So I will endeavor never to do that and to listen to the things that I learned from the scriptures. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. And covering a sin is like forgiving a sin. It means forgetting the sin, not bringing 
remembering it, not, I mean, forcefully making a decision to forget it. And you know how often you have to do that? Sometimes a lot. It's not a once and done. Why? Well, I, I forgave you, but I'll never forget about it. And I'll always remind you. <laughs> you see the hypocrisy in that? Proverbs 79 says, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Repeating a matter to somebody else is going to cause division. Don't think that you're being an instrument of God bringing healing and reconciliation because you're not. You're a person who's putting a seed of dissension. And understand that's one of the things that God hates, by the way. In Matthew 18, this is about confronting somebody. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17 says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, notice who they sinned against, you. You know, a lot of us go to people because we think they sinned against someone else, and somehow through gossip, we're now involved. And so now I'm going to go and tell you what I think about you and what you did to my friend. You see how messed up that is? Because there's no reconciliation there. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. We call that intervention. It's biblical. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Notice this person needs to be in the church. Those of you who remember, take heart. Things could get brought to the church. And let him be to you, if they refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. A heathen is an ungodly person where you don't recognize their testimony about Jesus Christ, obviously and a tax collector, somebody that is intent on ripping you off. An IRS agent, carry it, pack and heat. Treat him with respect, but I won't treat him like a brother. And there's no fellowship. So there's a time to confront and there's a time to cover. I think some of us do more covering than we should. I think some of us confront everybody about everything. I don't like the way you chew. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to keep my mouth shut when I chew. I hope you can have a heart of forgiveness and don't keep giving me that eye. Cool it. So, confront or cover, but decide. Some people don't decide. You know, yeah, 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 I forgive you, but pff, I'll never forget when you did this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you covering this or are you confronting? Are we dealing with this? Because if we're dealing with it, I can tell you what I'm going to say. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I will never do it again. And that's how you resolve stuff. You have to take responsibility for what you've done. You need to recognize it's wrong. You need to apologize and understand the pain that you've caused. You need to ask for forgiveness. And that you put yourself out there when you do that. Can you forgive me? Would you please forgive me? I will never do that again. So if we're going to bring it up and talk about it, I may have to do that process a bunch of times before somebody actually lets it go. And they put the gavel down. And they decide not to be my judge. It happens to me. I, I hope that doesn't happen to you. In 1 Peter 4.8, it says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. That, that means a fiery love. It means your heart's on fire. Like when you, like you guys, it's, hey, say hello to somebody and I can't get you to sit down. That's what fervent love looks like. And you know what? I'm not going to stop that, but we do have other things we need to get to. That's fiery love. You know, we have, we have a couple of guests that came in today and I, I saw you guys swarming them. I'm like, yes. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. 
To love somebody in spite of their sin or in spite of what they've done to you, isn't that what Jesus did for us? When he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? And if we're his followers, we do what he's done. We follow in his footsteps. And so Noah, getting back to our story, awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Well, I asked questions. How did he know? How did he know if he was in a drunken stupor and completely asleep? How did he know what his younger son had done to him? By the way, there are those who say that Ham was the youngest son uh, because of this passage. What was done to him is my question. Because that's very exact wording, isn't it? What was done to him? Well, here's some theories and, and doing some research. There are some people that say, well, he just walked in on his dad and that's why his dad was so upset because he didn't knock on the tent or something. Uh, or he was told by his brothers the mockery that he made of his father. That's a possibility that he knew because he was told. There are other people, in fact, some Jewish rabbis have conjecture that he did more than just intently and look at his dad, that he castrated his dad. I'm just saying, that's what some people are thinking, but that's what we call eisegesis. Eisegesis is reading into a passage instead of pulling out from a passage, which is exo-Jesus. So not Jesus like Jesus on the cross, it's G-E-S, never mind. So castration that there was parental incest that may have happened. That he went in there and this long looking, inspecting turned into some sort of a uh, inappropriate relationship. These, these are people who have greater degrees than I do that are postulating these things. And then some say that there was a maternal incest that Ham laid with his mom. And so there are all sorts of reasons why people might believe these things. I just thought I'd let you know that there are people out there looking for new subjects for their doctoral thesis. And this is what happens. So don't get drunk because you may wake up in a different state. I'm serious. You might wake up in another state. You certainly will be in a different state than you were when you slept. Uh, that I'll never forget what a hangover feels like, that disgusting headache. You want to vomit all the time, but you can't because you already expelled everything. You can't walk, you're dizzy. It's, it's like being sick on purpose. Why? Well, there are lots of reasons why. But. And then he said, cursed be Canaan. And we've already been introduced to who Canaan is. Canaan is the son of Ham. Seems to be an interesting thing for him to say once waking up, the very first thing off his lips, he curses Canaan, his grandson. Does this seem weird to you? Yeah. Okay, good. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant, and may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. It's, it's kind of like a secret code word almost, right? What Noah is doing is what Jacob does later on where he blesses his kids. And he's delving out curses at this point in time. And he doesn't curse Ham. If Ham's the guy that did the thing, don't you think he'd be cursing Ham? Why does he curse Canaan? I ask such questions and, and I have to try to figure it out. I'm here to confuse you. So, why curse the grandson for sin of his father? That seems bizarre, doesn't it? I think about the, in Numbers 14, 18, it says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation. As a parent, I read that and say, that ain't right. 
God is going to punish my kids for my sin? Mm -hmm. Sometimes he does. Notice what it says in the beginning. He's full of mercy to those who call on him. Just know that your actions, your reactions, your bad decisions are all being watched. All of them. I, I, th I think of my kids in the car as I'm driving. Are they picking up words <laughs> that I'm using, expletives? And it gets handed down from generation to generation, doesn't it? So it very well could be that. Or perhaps it's something more. There are blessings that are pronounced here as well. Blessed be the Lord of and God of Shem. Notice he doesn't bless Shem. He blesses the God of Shem. That's curious. And may Canaan be his servant. And God enlarge Japheth. Actually, the word Japheth means to enlarge, which is rather an interesting thing. May he enlarge he who is called enlarge. <laughs> and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. So somehow Japheth is going to be under the covering of Shem. It's interesting. And may Canaan be his servant. So Canaan is going to have to serve both of them. They're going to be in this, this place of servitude. Now there are people way back in antiquity who have used this as an example as why slavery should be legal for those who are of a different color. And that's not at all what the Bible says. Just so that you know, in case you hear that, you can say, that's not at all what the Bible says. So Noah lived after the flood, 350 years, and so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. That closes the chapter on Noah. Interestingly enough, in Philadelphia, in a basement, they have just found a 6,500-year-old mummy that was dug up here near the region of Ur, and they believe that this could very well have been Noah. They lost him. He was in the basement for 90 years, and they, they just completely forgot about him. Anyway, I thought it was an interesting news story. Uh, but he's in Philadelphia. So, but he died. It reminds me of Genesis in chapter 3, where it says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he died just like everyone else before him died and just like everyone after him died. Some were resuscitated. Jesus Christ rose some people from the dead and yet they would die again because sin leads to death. All sin does, and every one of us has a lifespan, and none of us knows how long. This is actually a stone carving that they found not very far from that area, and there are eight stick figures with a rainbow, and I think that's rather significant. I, I find these little tidbits and just throw them up on the screen. I, th I think that there's probably more to the story, and I want to read you this from the Scriptures. In Leviticus 20, verses 17 to 21, it says, If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness. By the way, you know what's going on there, right? It is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off from the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he shall bear his guilt. If a man lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, he has exposed her flow, and she has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother or sister or your father's sister, for this would uncover his near of kin. They shall bear their guilt. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. And if he uncovers his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. Interesting turn of phrase. 
in Leviticus 18, 6 to 9. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. So my wife is my nakedness. This is an interesting phrase. Could it be that Canaan did something other than what we read very plainly in uncovering his father's nakedness? It very well could have been matriarchal incest. And that's why Canaan was cursed, because he was the son, not of Noah, but the son of Ham and Noah's wife. Something to think about. Something you can argue about later. My, it, it, it seems very plain that you're not to have relations with those who are close, close relatives with you, and we, we know what happens. I have all kinds of pictures of what happens when you marry and try to procreate with people who are close relatives of yours. There are certain pockets of our country where it's actually uh, recommended you do this, and it never turns out well. And yet to uncover your father's nakedness means to have sexual relations with your mother. If you just read through the scriptures without looking, it seems to be one thing. And then when you dig a little deeper and you discover some of the things that are contextually back and part of the history. And by the way, Leviticus as well as Genesis were written by the same guy. Same turn of phrase something to consider. What I'd like you to think about is how do you treat people that fall short? Is your heart toward, toward them love? Or you just can't wait to nail them to the wall, man, and let everybody know what a foul, horrible, terrible person they were. If so, it reveals much about what's going on in your heart, much less about their behavior, but much more about your own heart. I hope you guys are enjoying all of this. Now I know why in the very first verse, verse 18, that Ham was the father of Canaan. Why that's mentioned there. It makes a lot of sense. There was an unwelcome stowaway on the ark. It was our sin nature. And we carry it around, unfortunately, and the only power that we will ever gain over it is when we submit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope you can forgive the high drama of this chapter. And I pray that you, the Lord would bless you on your day today.